It's my pleasure to welcome you today to Machine Vision for Cultural Heritage and Natural Science Collections, a program of the Yale-Smithsonian Partnership. This is the first in what we hope to be a number of study days that are held either in New Haven or in DC um, that sort of bring together folks, not just who are on the board or who've been active in the Yale-Smithsonian Partnership, but who are active in, in all levels of, of the university and the institution, respectively. Um, and the theme we've chosen for this first study day held here in Sterling Library in the Frankie Family Digital Humanities Laboratory is machine vision. And you can hear this described as computer vision. Um, you hear this described very broadly as artificial intelligence, um, neural networks. But we really wanted to focus on the computational analysis of raster pixels, especially coming from an institution like Yale, which has had such a, a strength of excellence in linked open data, RDF tuples, open access images. We really wanted to push the boundary and explore what could happen if we started actually analyzing the pixels of some of our natural heritage collections and our uh, uh, cultural heritage collections as well. And so that was the reason we decided to call this machine vision for cultural heritage and natural science collections. We knew that both institutions had world famous um, natural science museums and, and institutions of research and teaching. And we also knew about the world class collections of art and other objects, sculpture, um, history that were present on both campuses and in both institutions. So machine vision for cultural heritage and natural science collections unifies those resources which are, um, are hundreds of years old and it puts that together with some te techniques which are very new, which have their origins perhaps in, in the mid-century, the 20th century, but which in the last four or five or six years have really taken off as ways of analyzing visual data at scale. And there's really no better um, way to start us off than with our first uh, keynote speaker, who is Rebecca Dikau from the Data Science Lab and the Office of the Chief Information Officer at the Smithsonian Institution. She'll be speaking uh, today on data-intensive approaches to digitized museum collections. Rebecca? Thank you, Peter, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in the Data Science Lab. Uh, I will preface it by saying I'm a trained biologist um, and came into the um, high performance computing world uh, when I was generating genomics data as part of my dissertation. Uh, and since I arrived at the Smithsonian uh, after my PhD in uh, September of 2012 as a postdoc, uh, I started thinking about uh, Smithsonian collections more broadly and not just genomic data. And so today I'll talk to you about how we're expanding our big data research uh, outside of biology, but I'll start with biology. So the Smithsonian has a number of challenges uh, to conducting large-scale uh, informatics research. First is there's a large diversity of locations, heterogeneous kinds of digital data, incomplete metadata, and a lack of purpose-built software tools. This is particularly true for uh, our biology groups where most genomics tools have been developed around the human genome and uh, the genomes that uh, Smithsonian scientists are interested in are everything but the human genome. So everything from clams to um, bacteria, bacteria are a little bit easier than, than everything else, um, to plants, to pretty much anything you can imagine. And so we're constantly on the lookout for new tools and seeing how our data fit into existing, existing models. So this is a, this isn't just a terribly resolved uh, photo, it's um, a photo mosaic of uh, an aerial shot of the mall from our archives that I, um, all the pixels are filled with other uh, aerial shots and other building photos of the Smithsonian. So I thought for a machine vision uh, workshop that might be somewhat interesting. So the Smithsonian has 19 museums, nine research centers, and a zoo, most of which are on the Smithsonian Mall but some of which are very far flung. So we have the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, which has a large group of very accomplished evolutionary biologists, uh, field biologists, um, and the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center out in Annapolis, Maryland as well, who, does, who do uh, ecological research. So we're not just collections based, but um, research data based as well. So when we talk about digitized collections, I will keep a natural history focus for now, um, just to talk about the different kinds of, of digitized data that, that we're talking about. Um, photos, so for example, this is a photo of a pinned fly, uh, the taxonomic names, specimen records, 
genomic sequences, so we have data uh, in GenBank, georeferenced localities, um, and label data, transcribed label data as well. I would say that these are all part of the collections object, but then there are other kinds of auxiliary data that might be part of our understanding of this one specimen, which could come from field books where scientists who have collected these um, specimens, uh, you know, wrote down some observations about it, illustrations, uh, again, observations, you know, what was this fly eating at the time it was collected, scientific publications, and taxonomic descriptions. So these are all, these all could be linked. These all are part of what we know about this fly. Um, and being able to compute across all of these uh, data is uh, something that we strive for. This is just an example of what a specimen collecting event looks like in terms of where the data go. So in the center, this is Vicki Funk. She's a curator of botany and a, a great collaborator of mine. So for example, she went out uh, to collect this uh, purple, uh, very pretty flower. The species is called Centropallus pulsiflorus. We decided we wanted to sequence this genome because it is a part in the sunflower family tree that has no genome uh, around it, so we thought it would be interesting. She collected the seeds, actually, and we grew it in a greenhouse uh, because we needed a lot of DNA for the kind of DNA sequencing we were doing. So from the actual specimen, uh, most of the plant gets pressed, and so you can see a, an image of a pressed plant. Um, some of it goes to a biorepository, so we have its DNA forever. You might sequence a small piece of DNA, uh, a barcode for, for plants. Those are chloroplast genes. Those data go to NCBI, which is uh, part of NIH. It's generally called GenBank. Um, and then the specimen information, so uh, there's the specimen record, which is uh, in the Natural History Museum. It goes to a database called EMU. And those data are pushed to GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, so that you can go to GBIF and find records of specimens from our museums and also lots of other institutions. The photo might go to iDigBio. So this is just one specimen, and this is all the places that those data go to. It gets way more complicated. So that's before any research question, right? So that's just like we're, we're going to document that we collected this and have put it in the places it needs to go. But in order to do uh, the research questions Vicky's interested in, we didn't want to just sequence the chloroplast gene. We wanted to sequence the entire genome. Um, so let's see. These are the different kind of parts of research that we engage in. So the little museum icons at the top show we need, in order to uh, generate the deep learning models that uh, Alex will talk about later, we need data from lots of different museums. We need specimen records, locality information, and images from all over the place. In order to build a phylogeny, we need to sequence, uh, in this case, this is a paper we're about to publish with 256 species in the sunflower family. We sequenced 1,000 genes for all those 256 species. So those data go to NCBI, but we may, in some cases, uh, pull data from NCBI from other institutions. And then for the genomics, there's a huge uh, amount of software tools that we need just to assemble uh, and annotate the genome. We make a genome browser, I'll, I'll show um, closer views of these. We'll make a genome browser that we can share with our collaborators where they can continue to keep editing our annotation. And then, well, that's one genome. What about all the genomes that are being generated at the Smithsonian? I'll show uh, something that's under construction for us, which is the Smithsonian Genome Hub, where Smithsonian researchers can put all their genomes in one place and uh, start thinking about how to use them together. So the research is what adds a huge amount of complexity. Again, this is for one group of plants. There are hundreds of Smithsonian researchers that are kind of doing things along these lines. I'll take a, a short little look at genomics. Um, genomics at the Smithsonian has been, yeah, in, we're generally really good at natural history. The scientists at the Smithsonian know their organisms. They know where to go in the field to collect a species. They know everything about it. But genomics has been uh, a big challenge to get all the software that uh, researchers need working well for their data. 
This is just an example of some of the tools that you need to assemble a genome and annotate it. Um, and a lot of times you have to try multiple kinds of software to see what works best for the data. This is just zooming into the genome browser that we're creating where you have these uh, prediction tracks. So this is just zoomed into a very small piece of one scaffold and all of the uh, gene predictions on there, which scientists can go in and say, okay, I know about um, genes for drought tolerance. I will go and, and look at those and see in detail, does that look right and how can I extract that and compare it to uh, other genomes that I know about. So we're trying to also, we're doing this in the cloud right now so we can easily share it with other researchers outside the Smithsonian. Um, so we have a high performance computing cluster and part of my work is uh, helping to administer this. Um, there are about 4,000 CPUs and 26 total terabytes of RAM. That graph, um, the plot just shows in the last 30 days the usage. Um, so it is kind of up and down and it has a weekly cycle, <laughs> so people don't do as much work on the weekends, uh, which is good. Um, but it's been really, really busy. Uh, we have 16 very high memory nodes, so a genome assembly often you need a terabyte or two terabytes of RAM to assemble a genome. These are pretty beefy nodes. Uh, we have many high CPU nodes as well because most of uh, bioinformatics software doesn't work well uh, in MPI frameworks. It's uh, multi-threaded. For GPUs, um, we have a node with NVIDIA K80s, but more recently we've, uh, my team has uh, gotten two workstations with uh, NVIDIA GP100s um, and we're, we'll probably upgrade the GPUs in Hydra very soon. We have more than 300 genomic software packages installed on Hydra. This is just an ongoing thing where people are requesting things, you know, I don't know, maybe five times a week we get requests for more software. And around 550 users. In terms of natural history, that's about, I think, 182 natural history museum users of Hydra. It's a lot. Um, the Hydra started at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Astrophysicists are way ahead in terms of high-performance computing, but we're catching up, and so we have as many biology users as astrophysics users, which is really a big change. It's really exciting. So um, training is a big part as well of what we do because we have hundreds of researchers, um, curators, postdoctoral fellows, graduate fellows, interns, that all want to do this kind of research. Um, so Smithsonian has joined the Carpentries organization. I'm sure many of you have heard of data software and library carpentry. Uh, we joined, I think, two years ago, and now we have 13 trained instructors with, I think, 10 more that are just finalizing their uh, instructor uh, training. And in the past three years, we've trained more than 300 researchers in Python, R, genome analysis. We started doing more ad hoc workshops, so people want to learn genome assembly, so we would do uh, a six-week um, workshop with an hour a week talking about genome assembly. But then we realized we um, did a survey of Hydra users and said, what kind of workshops are you interested in? And it turned out that, you know, Python, R, very um, ground level um, workshops in techniques that they can then apply to all sorts of research or what people were really interested in. We keep all our workshop materials on a GitHub page which you can go to and we, as part of our website, we have a schedule and a place where you can uh, request workshops as well. So our instructors would be happy to go uh, anywhere and give, give these workshops. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about the Biodiversity Genome Hub. It's under construction. Um, but we're really excited about it. So the plan is to have a place that's accessible not just within the Smithsonian but uh, to our collaborators where we can have all of our genome data together. So it's even hard for us at the Smithsonian to list all the genome projects that are going on. I've tried to get this information. It's something like 150, but um, having one place where we can bring all the data together and have standards about how people are storing that data and making sure it's backed up and making sure it's described in a way that um, makes it reusable. It's really important. So we're constructing this um, website which will uh, be run through Galaxy, which is a bioinformatics um, software, um, uh, an open source way to 
make reproducible pipelines and workflows of different tools as it wraps around any kind of bioinformatics tool you'd want. And we hope to provide researchers the ability to do basic analytics on their genomes once they're sequenced and share them with other people. And hopefully allow students and, and um, you know, undergraduates and, and graduate students to really get into genomics um, in a not so uh, intimidating way. So now I'll talk more about the computer vision stuff. Sorry for the detour, but I think it's, um, the genomics work is still pretty exciting. So I'll give you four examples of some of the work we're starting on. I got, uh, the botany project is the most mature, and Alex will be talking about that this afternoon, and the other ones are um, just still experiments at this point, but pretty exciting. So um, the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office has started a program in the Natural History Museum to digitize or generate images and transcriptions of the labels for all the botanical specimens in the herbarium, of which there are five million. So there's this uh, conveyor belt that runs eight hours a day and generates thousands of images per day, I don't know exactly. Um, I think there are three million at this point that are completed. And as a first step, a number of years, uh, two and a half years ago or so, we thought, okay, let's see if we can train deep learning models to detect, uh, to classify, and to detect mercury staining. And why mercury staining? Well, botanists used to preserve their specimens with mercury to keep pests away. And we know that, that now that that's not a great thing to have uh, alongside people. Um, and you can see the specimen on the left uh, has been stained with mercury, and over the years, the mercury crystallizes out, and so it's very visible uh, to the human eye. But it's not generally part of the metadata for the specimen. So uh, on, sometimes there's a little poison stamp on some of them. We're not exactly sure if that directly correlates to whether it has mercury or not, or it could mean something else. Um, but we can see it. It's not part of the metadata. So I thought we thought an interesting question was, well, can the computer see it? And can we then point out hot spots in the collection that might be uh, where some remediation might be required? They put uh, the mercury stained specimens that they know about into special folders, but no one person can open five million folders to check uh, the rest of them. And then family ID, these are two different families of fern allies. Um, they're quite similar to non-fern biologists, uh, such as myself. <laughs> um, and we thought we would do a very simple binary classification problem. Can we tell these apart with good accuracy? And NVIDIA helped us with this uh, first pilot as well. So these are just uh, confusion matrices showing uh, for each uh, model that we built, the, uh, the number, this is just the, the test set, so we, um, I should have mentioned earlier that we had to manually um, find a training set of mercury stained specimens, so it was a lot of hours of going through images, and we pulled, we, we had a set of 10,000 that were mercury stained and 10,000 that were clean that we labeled by hand. And the confusion matrix shows, just for a test set, um, which of the stained and unstained actual uh, images were predicted to be stained and unstained. So you would hope that the diagonal going this way would be 100%. Um, it's not 100%. Um, but the number of, uh, it did very well. So the percentage is in the 90s for both the family identification and the mercury staining. So we're really excited about the fact that this worked, and you will hear what's next for botany in a very, very, we've expanded this greatly uh, this afternoon, so I won't talk any more about that now. And we'll talk a little bit about bumblebees as well. Um, you may say, like, that's pretty random, lions and bumblebees, but <laughs> because the digitization program office has targeted specific collections, we've kind of gone with where the data are right now. And so the bumblebee project was to photograph all the specimens of bumblebees, around 45,000. Uh, bumblebees are all part of the same genus, Bombus. And so all of these are photographed. <laughs> this is just examples of how the photos look. They're generally um, just a lateral view. Some of them are a, a dorsal view. The labels are 
are as well in the in the image. And I, when I looked at these, I thought, I don't, <laughs> I can't tell these apart at all. I, I, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, entomologists might say, well, you know, the way we tell these apart is very specific banding patterns and genitalia. Like, well, we can't really see that in these images very well, so I don't, I don't know, but we'll give it a try. And the other interesting part of this project is the transcription was crowdsourced through the Tr Smithsonian Transcription Center, which is where volunteers go online and can transcribe label data, which is a really great way to get people involved in, uh, in real research. And so um, all of our labels, we have good uh, transcribed data, so we didn't really have to go through and make a training set ourselves. The interesting thing is that um, about more than 10,000 were unidentified. And I talked to the uh, bee curator at Natural History, and he said, no, that can't be. That can't be. And then we opened the cabinets and said, yeah, 10,000 of these are unidentified. So the idea being that if our model can um, classify to species pretty well, we could at least have estimates of what the other unidentified bees are. We may not be able to put that directly back into the collections system, but we can at least tell researchers coming in, these, you might also be interested in these specimens because we think they're this species. So this didn't show up super well, but we trained two models so far, a subgenus model. There are 15 subgenera of Bombus that we have in our data set, and the overall accuracy is above 93%. And for the species model, this was really interesting. Uh, we're still uh, just starting out working with this. But there's 178 species. And some of them have 10 images or so. And so I've thrown them all in, even though those are very small amounts of data. And it's still overall very accurate. So the next steps are to talk to the bee curator in more detail about whether any of the things that are more often confused are actual taxonomic issues that are either mislabeled in the data or they are very, very closely related. Um, and we're also just, just starting to experiment with the activation heat maps that we can generate from the models that allow us to look at which pixels are activated in the model and start understanding you know, what the model is lo looking at in the B. And I think, um, Success in this area will be really important to convincing the biologists that it's not just a black box, that we're actually, you know, where the model is seeing the same kinds of characters that you're looking at in your microscope, and it's not so scary. So now I'll talk a little bit about a project we're really just starting, but the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute Center for Conservation and Sustainability, they work with oil companies mostly to look at impacts of uh, installing pipelines, mostly in the Amazon. And with this project, there is a company that's looking to install this flexible pipeline, and they are looking to um, look at baseline uh, biodiversity before, during, and after the installation. And so they've traditionally used camera traps and people actually catching, um, catching animals, taking DNA, but we're trying a new approach where uh, fishermen have been given cameras and given training into how to photograph uh, fish that they, they catch. We're getting the images, and now we will start training a model to see if we can identify fish to species um, that are, and as, as the pipeline gets installed, we can have a time series, hopefully, of what the communities look like before, during, and after at different time points, and then figure out what, what impacts the pipeline has on fish uh, communities. That's really exciting because it has real world impact. And then I'll talk briefly about two uh, other collaborations we're working on. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, approached us because they have lots of digital data, mostly scans, well, the, the project we're talking about is scans of documents without uh, any metadata about them, just what archive they come from. So we are currently looking for a postdoc to lead this project um, to first uh, just start understanding more about the kinds of documents that they have. So they have a lot of diaries, letters, lists, birth certificates, marriage certificates, just all sorts of um, archival data 
around the time uh, that the Holocaust was happening and making it more discoverable for researchers that come to their uh, museum to do research and in terms of the, digi the digital data don't know where to start. So we're hoping to um, make a dent in that. And the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative is another pan-Smithsonian initiative that started last year um, with a large digital component. And we're hoping to contribute by uh, training machine learning models to uh, find, again, have a better baseline data about how women have been involved in the Smithsonian over time, both in collecting objects as well as producing artworks and uh, where, you know, where are the women in the Smithsonian? What, have, what stories have we missed uh, in, in the last 150 years? So to that end, we um, have some preliminary data from Smithsonian archives where we're looking at official Smithsonian photographer uh, images where generally they go through and identify people that, let's say, for example, this is an example of a, a photo they're really just interesting on a human level to look at the photos of what was going on in the 1970s. Um, in this case, the women are all identified, uh, but there are many, many thousands of images where uh, people aren't identified. And in group portraits, um, more often, men are identified and women are left out for whatever reason. So we're hoping to first get a survey of you know, how, you know, how many times women that are labeled in these images show up in, in other images that aren't labeled and to start getting some baseline data about that. Here are just some examples. And then this is kind of, there are lots of group portraits like these where it's from a meeting or from something else and, and people aren't labeled, but maybe um, we can start making connections between people where we have images where we know where they are. Um, and also finding um, completely outside of knowing who they are clustering, uh, clustering faces as well in, in the um, official photographs to try to find people who maybe haven't been described. We don't have their story represented in any um, Smithsonian uh, collection or, or metadata, but maybe we can start elevating their stories. So the takeaways are uh, we've really only just started <laughs> this work. There's so much to do. And right now, every, oh, sorry, the typo, every application of machine learning is, is a research project given our diverse and incomplete, unique data. And so I made another photo mosaic of the uh, castle with uh, all the portrait data that I've gotten from archives, so portraits of, of Smithsonian people where we know the people. Um, but I keep thinking, you know, what, who are we missing when we're talking about um, who has kind of built the Smithsonian. And so hoping that we can use these tools to elevate new stories that better represent the people who actually visit the Smithsonian. And so here's my, uh, my team, and I, this work would not happen without them. Um, uh, we have from the, from the left, my postdoc, Miriam Sushia, Mike Trisna, and uh, Alex White. Alex will be talking later. Um, our partners across the Smithsonian. Again, this work wouldn't be possible without all the other Smithsonian units. Um, and funding the Smithsonian Women's Committee, the Office of the Provost, and the Office of the CIO. So, thanks. <laughs>